If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to continue a series we started a couple weeks ago called Soul Care. We were actually talking about this in November. We were talking about it in December, but we kicked off this official series the 1st of January. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, I want to say thank you for being a part of our online service today. Make sure you leave a comment or, or a like. Let us know that you're there. Matthew chapter 11 We've been talking about soul care, and we've been talking about really breaking off some things out of our life, and over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about maybe getting rid of social media or letting that go as much as possible, uh, and I know some of you, that's your job, and that's your income, and I understand that, but limit it as much as possible. Let's get away from the rectangular boxes that seem to be controlling our life. It's the first thing many of us see when we get up. It's the last thing we look at when we go to bed. And everywhere we go, it just seems like there's these rectangular boxes. And we talked about maybe living a more carefree life. And I'm not just talking about just getting off of social media or really slowing down the Internet and its influence on our life. What I'm talking about is you allowing yourself to get into the presence of God. Right? Get into the presence of God. Get into the Word of God and care for your soul. Care for your soul. We've been talking about that. You can go to our podcast or check out our Facebook page, and you can catch all of the, the past week's sermons. But I started really, and I even read this verse at the very beginning, and I want to read it to you again from Matthew chapter 11. Verse 28 says, Come to me, all you who, are labor, who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, the Message Bible is not a translation. It's a paraphrase. A guy by the name of Eugene Peterson wrote it. Now, I want you to listen to it in the Message paraphrase. Here's what it says. Are you tired? Check. <laughs> Anybody? Check that box. Worn out? Check. Burnt out on religion? Check, check. Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. I love this. Watch how I do it. And then this next phrase gets me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Woo. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Say freely. freely. Say lightly. lightly. Does that describe 2023? Yes. Freely and lightly. Do you see the world just operating freely <laughs> and lightly? It seems like, no, no, no. We are heavy laden, not freely and lightly. But that's the life that God has called us to live. He's called us to live a free life and a light life, not carrying around the burdens, the baggage, all the pain, everything from season to season, from year to year, from relationship to relationship. Come on now, from life event to life event. You know, true story, watch this. I once flew to Atlanta and back in the same day. And I had no bags, none. We had a, a family in the church and the man was diagnosed with cancer and he was sitting at a cancer center in Atlanta, Georgia. And so I got on a plane, Palm Beach International, first thing in the morning, no bags. The lady said, do you have any bags? Nope. No check-in? Nope, nothing. Nothing to check in, nothing to carry on. I walked on the plane with nothing. Everybody else is putting bags in an overhead bin. I got nothing, nothing. I just walk in and I just sit down. When the plane lands, I just get up and they're all going, trying to grab their bags. I don't have a thing. I get off the plane. They all head to the baggage claim area. I walk right out of the airport. Come on now. I get in my rental car. I get in the rental car, no bags. Get to the hospital, didn't even have to lock the car, nothing to steal. There ain't nothing in that car to steal. I got nothing. 
I got my wallet, I got my phone, that's it. I go, spend a couple hours with the family, get back in the car, no bags, go back to the airport, come on now, went to the restroom. You ever try that with bags? Went to the restroom, come on now, <laughs> no bags. Waiting for the airplane, got on the airplane, no bags, got off the airplane, no bags. That's what you call freely and lightly. Now I want to compare that to when I travel with my wife, who is the most awesome person that has ever been born. But she likes to bring the whole closet Come on, husbands, where are you at? Come on, men, you know. Every shoe. We're going to Mexico in the summer, and it's like, jacket? What, what in the world? Jacket, I mean, everything, we got it. And we were flying spirit. If you know, you know. They charge you for everything. Water, bag, carry-on, come on now, breathing, everything. They charge you for everything, flying spirit. It's not free, and it's not light. Come on now. But that's the life that God intended us to live, because it is difficult to go into a new season if you're still carrying the bags, come on now, the baggage of the previous season. Right? Watch what God says to, to Samuel. God says something to Samuel, 1, 16, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. Here's what he says. How long, Samuel, are you going to mourn over Saul, seeing I have rejected him? Right? Isn't it interesting that, that God says this to Samuel? He says, how long are you going to mourn over him? I'm trying to get you, Samuel, to step into a new season, but you keep mourning over an old season that I'm trying to reject from Israel. In fact, I believe here's what God's saying, because mourning is an act of our soul, isn't it? Now, I'm not talking about mourning over a loved one that we lost, because Saul was still alive. So that's not the situation. We grieve over those that we've lost. We don't grieve like the world grieves. We grieve with hope, right? So this isn't mourning over the loss of a loved one. This is stuck in a season. You're stuck. You're, you're emotionally attached because here's what I believe God is saying to Samuel. He says, how long are you going to stay emotionally attached to someone or something I'm trying to remove from your life. Woo, come on now. And we've been there. I've been there. You've probably been there. Listen, stuck, emotionally attached to something that God is trying to remove from our life. Listen, endings are necessary. Did you hear me? Endings are necessary. You can't step into adulthood if you're stuck in childhood. It, you, it's necessary for childhood to come to an end for you to step into adulthood. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 11, he said, when I was a child, did you hear that part? When I was a child, when I was a child, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, I, I, I was in that, stuck in that season. But then he says this, when I became a man, did you hear that part? When I became a man, listen, that doesn't mean when I became of age, it means when I stepped into a new season, right? When I became a man, I put away childish things. And childish things are not necessarily evil things, they're just seasonal things. They're just seasonal things. And I've seen people stuck in seasons. Stuck, still carrying baggage and hurt and pain and all these things that they're carrying from a previous season. And they want to embrace the new. They really want something fresh. They want a new season to begin in their life. But they have trouble letting go of the old. And you can't move forward if you can't move past. Amen? So you have to understand, God's trying to get something, get you somewhere and, and get something to you and maybe someone in you or someone to you, I should say, but you are stuck in a season. Can I give you some advice? If the horse is dead, 
dismount. Because you can't beat a dead horse. And we're stuck in these seasons. And God's trying to say to us, hey, listen, how long are you going to be emotionally attached to that thing? It's time to let that thing go. Let that person go. Let that season go. Let the bags and the pain and the emotional hurt that is affecting your soul, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about soul wounds and soul care. Let that thing go. Get rid of it so that I could bring you to some place or something and do something fresh and new in your life. Get rid of the bags. Learn to live freely and lightly. Amen? So I happen to bring a bag with me. Are you ready for this? I brought this because I wanted to give you this illustration that this is a bag. All right. And it is heavy. And so this is what we look like. Now, when I was in school, we didn't have backpacks. That wasn't for us. You had one book and one folder, and you didn't carry it down here. You carried it up here because you were cool. And so, but then somehow, like in the 90s, backpacks came back or something like that. So this is what we think. We think that when we are carrying our baggage, we carry it like this. Like you've got it right here, but you can't. It's cool when you only have one strap. And so you carry it like this, and you know what I'm saying? Like, and you're just like, what's up? Hey, what's up? You know what I mean? And you're like... You got it, and it's all back here, and nobody can really see the issues of your life. You know what I mean? Like, they get to meet you first, and then they'll find the issues later. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so you, you think that, that, that you're all it. You know what I mean? But this is not how we carry the baggage into a new season. You want me to show you how we carry the baggage into a new season? We don't carry it like that. This is how, you ready? This is how we carry the bags... You know what I'm saying? Like, we've turned the backpack into a fanny pack. And so we, we got this. This is not a good look. Hey, how you doing? You know what I'm saying? Like, all of our issues are out for everybody to see. You think you're hiding them. You ain't hiding nothing. You walking around. Let me tell you, this is heavy. This is heavy. And this is how you, and you wonder why can't I get close? Well, I got alligator arms. I don't know why I can't get close to anybody You know what I mean? And you're trying to get close to people, and you're still wondering, why can't this relationship work out? Why can't this season work out? It's because you got all this. This is all you got, and it's front and center for everybody to see. All right? And so I want to know this. How do I unpack? Are you ready for this? How do I unpack this? I'm going to give you five things you're going to unpack. Are you ready? Here's five things you are going to unpack. In no particular order, all right? Five things you're going to unpack. The first one is this, rejection. And let me tell you, everybody deals with rejection. Do you know that Jesus himself was rejected? The Bible says the stone that the builders rejected became the what? Chief cornerstone. Do you know that his own family, those that he was closest to, the ones he grew up with, They rejected him, right? They rejected him. And so I want you to know this. It's impossible to go through life without feeling rejection. And it's especially painful when it's somebody that was close to us, when it's a family member, when it's a parent that walks out of our life, when if it's a kid that's cut us off, it's especially painful. And we carry the wound of rejection. And I've said this before, and here's the challenge that we all face, is sometimes rejection does not show up as pain. Sometimes it shows up as personality. And you wonder, why am I passive aggressive? Why am I always angry? It's because of this right here. You're, you're, it's the pain of rejection. So we deal with rejection. The second thing we deal with is unforgiveness. And I can just tell you this. I believe there are two major open doors that, that, that open our life up to the enemy and demonic activity. And one of them is unforgiveness. Matthew chapter 18 teaches us unforgiveness opens the door to the enemy, to demonic activity in our life. We have to forgive We have got to forgive those who have hurt us and wounded us. And so we have to learn to forgive. The third one is this. We deal with this, strongholds. Strongholds. 
Strongholds are those addictions, those sins that we carry from season to season to season. And, and it's those issues of our life, that those chains that just seem to keep following us. And it's been a year and five years and ten years and suddenly decades go by and we haven't seemed to be able to break the bondages of our life. And we keep carrying it from season to season. We think we're hiding it well, but we're not. It's front and center of our life. It's a stronghold, and it's been affecting us for a very long time. We have got to get rid of the strongholds in our life. And then the third one is this. A fourth one is regrets and regrets. And I believe just like rejection, it's impossible to go through life without regrets. Regret, if we could go back to something we did, something we said, some issue in our life, if we could just go back to that moment. And sometimes it's not what we did. Sometimes it's the things we didn't do. I should have. I wish I would have. And we all have these regrets. And then the last one is this. It's toxic relationships. You know what I find about toxic relationships is that toxic relationships, most people know that they're toxic. You don't need 10 ways to know that that relationship is toxic. You know. You know it's toxic. You know you got to get rid of it. You know that they're dragging you down. You know that that person's not drawing you closer to Christ. You know that that friendship is not something that God has ordained in your life. You know that you need to sever that thing. It's just hard to sever it. I mean, they're your friends. Those, that's who you hang out with. That's who you spend holidays with. That's who you go to parties with them, and you like. But God's saying get rid of the toxic relationship because that bad character that they exhibit is corrupting you. And this toxic relationship, this ungodly soul tie, God says it's got to be gone from your life. You can't carry them. Some people are not meant to be in your life forever. I know you may have grew up with them. I know that you're, they're your buddies and they were in your wedding. That doesn't mean that they're your forever friend. Come on now. Some people just God's called to us for a season and then that season's over. And we're ch trying to pump air into a tire that God's deflated. Do you know what I'm saying? We're still pumping air into something. God's deflated the thing, and we're wondering, why can't we get air in this thing? It's because God's saying, let it go. And then you just go, hey, okay, this is how you want me to live. Free from all the junk and all of the, the weight and all of this that I've been carrying for so long. I've been carrying this stuff for so long. And God, you have told me, hey, I need to be free and I need to live free and my soul needs to be cared for. And you say, Pastor, well, how do I do it? How do I, how do I get rid of, of all of the baggage and all of this? And I want you to know this first of all, time does not do it, time doesn't heal. Somebody said, time heal all, heals all wounds. No, it doesn't. If time healed, God would be unnecessary. You say, well, if I could just bring the right person into my life. No, no, no. That's not how you, you become the right person. You don't bring the right person into your life because you're still carrying the baggage. I don't care how godly they are. You need to work on you. Amen? And so it's not time. It's not the right person. And it's not just isolating ourselves. Sometimes we think, well, if I could just back away from everybody and everything, if I can just get alone, my alone time, alone with God, yes. But we still have to live life. You need to live with other people. We need to have godly relationships. You need to be in a place where you, you're receiving some Christian fellowship. So it's not just isolating yourself, and, and it's not just finding the right person, and it certainly is not time. And I would argue that the answer is one word from one verse, one word from one verse, and it's a verse many of you have heard many times, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace, that just means the punishment of our sins was upon him, by his stripes we are healed healed and I can tell you right now 
But the answer is not time. The answer isn't finding the right person who could bring balance into my life. The answer is not, well, I'm just going to go off. I'm just going to isolate myself. I'm just going to pull away from relationships for a period of time. That's never the answer. The answer is always, always healing. God, because you can cover up wounds. You could put makeup on a bruise. But do you know what? When somebody touches it, it hurts. You can cover up everything, but there's still a wound there. There's still a bruise there. That's why you say, well, well they're touchy. Yeah, because they're hurt. And hurt people hurt people. And so the only thing, the only answer, there is no other answer. The answer that God has prescribed for humanity is healing. Healing for our soul. In fact, that word in the Hebrew is the word Rapha. And it actually has more to do with what's happening on the inside of us than it does with our physical bodies. Yet we time to think it's only for our physical bodies. Does God heal our physical bodies? Absolutely he does. Absolutely that we can claim by his stripes our physical bodies are healed, cured of every disease, every sickness. The word of God teaches that. Absolutely it does. But do you know that this word is used over and over again to talk about what's happening on the inside of us? Let me give you some examples very quick. Hosea chapter number 14, verse number 4, says this. It says, I will heal. It's used for the word forgive. I will forgive. I will rafa their backslidings. He uses it as comfort in the word. In Psalm 147, verse 3, he says this. He heals. He comforts. He rafas the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And when watch this, in 2 Kings chapter 2, when the prophet of God threw salt into water that was poisoning the people, it says this, Thus saith the Lord, I have roffered, I have healed, I have purified this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. Healing, healing, forgiveness, comfort, purify. These are all contained in this word, which means to make whole. It is the healing power of God. And our souls need healing. Because we just go through seasons. And we go from relationship to relationship, from major event to major event. And we're still carrying the wounds of five years ago and ten years ago. Sometimes it's our childhood, it's an abuse, it's somebody who walked out on us, it's a, it's a form of rejection that's happened, and it happens all throughout life. And God says this, it's time for your soul to be healed. And ask Pastor Mark to come back to the keyboard for just a moment. I want to pray for you today. I do. And if you joined us on Facebook and you're part of our Facebook community, thank you for being a part of this service today. 